as Mesma. So Mesma, let's try. Let me try to invite you. And I hope it works. Yes, Mesma, you would have probably got an invitation now. Can you hear me? Okay. Ah. This works. <laughs> Welcome, Mesma. Thank you. Thank you, Akila. I'm so excited to be in conversation with you. Thank you so much for accepting our invitation. Thank you for inviting me. The pleasure is entirely mine. I mean, I've been following um, all your fantastic work on Instagram and then on your website as well. Um, and I was really keen to have this conversation. It allowed us to really, uh, you know, deep dive into your studio, so to speak. Both your, uh, the space where you paint and the space where you, you know, create your dance. Sort of go into deep dive into the, into the mind and the thought process of an artist like you who sort of, you know, um, I don't know, so multifaceted and versatile. So I'm going to quickly use you, Mesma, for the benefit of um, some of the uh, uh, be familiar with your work. I'm just going to set the context and then we will get started. Absolutely. Uh, Mesma Belsare uh, is a dancer, painter and actor um, who has been described by the New York Times as a tour de force and uh, by the Dance Current mag magazine as, as mesmerizing as staring into the heart of a fire. A professional dance career for two decades includes solo performances at a host of press venues across the United States. She's a recipient of the Cambridge Arts Council Artist Grant, the New England Foundation of the Arts Dance Fund, and the Government of Delhi India Scholarship for Advanced Training in Bharatanatyam and Indian Classical Music. Belsare was trained extensively in the art of Bharatanatyam, Kala Padma Dance Academy in Bhopal by Sri Shankar Bhopal, and thereafter the Nati Dhaka Academy by Padma Shri Gita Chandran. She received a diploma in Bharatanatyam from Indra Kala Sangeet University. Kheragar, a BFA from Delhi College of Art and a Master's in Education from Massachusetts College of Art and Design in Boston, USA. Uh, Belsare is continuing her studies under Maya Kulkarni, New York City, with whom she's co-creating new and interesting dance works. Mesma, warm welcome to you again. Thank you to everyone who's joined this conversation and who will be watching it later as well. Uh, Mesma, I'm firstly going to um, ask you really about what are you currently working on and what is your typical day like? Well, um, let me start with my day first and then I'll tell you what I'm currently working on. Can you hear me okay? I can. Yeah, okay. Because you're chopping up a little bit. So, but that's fine. I can still make out what you say. That's okay. fine. Um, well, my day begins, I like to begin it early and uh, I wake up and I realize, wow, I have another chance at it. <laughs> and to really, you know, when you're an artist, you're constantly haunted by the specter of inadequacy. Mm. And you are always wondering, what did I do yesterday that I shouldn't have done? How can I do that better today? What can I do today to improve on what I did yesterday? You know, and so you grow incrementally like that. So I wake up and I realize that, okay, Mesma, you didn't do this right yesterday. You must correct it today. You spent too much time on Netflix and you uh, wasted your time. You wild it away here and there. So you must correct that. Then I love to have my morning ritual of my morning tea and, you know, and I do some yoga asanas uh, to calm my mind. And then I love to leave through um, works of great artists. I really love that time of the day when I can look at people's works who done great things, you know, and I can only aspire to that kind of excellence and I can only inspire myself through them to try harder today. Uh, right. And that gets me going, you know, that pursuit of, of achieving something that is beyond, uh, that gets me going. And then I love to go in the studio, I love to work and, um, and that's how my hours are spent really. Mornings usually I like to spend um, on my body, body conditioning, uh, then going over some of the dance routines. And then afternoon is reserved for painting. Uh, so I have to I have to carve out time like that. And then the day just goes by and I love to eat, I love to cook, I love to try new things in my kitchen, <laughs> even though I fail miserably at it. But I still try, you know. 
so that's my typical day and at night i love to watch some movie or something like that some 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 sometimes i get carried away because you know art is so demanding and you you it really takes so much out of you uh, that by the end of the day you're exhausted you are just spent and but that is the good kind of exhaustion that you that you want you know right. it also energizes you it wants you to do more so that is what i love to do every day <laughs> and that sounds great and uh, do you sort of stick with this almost like a ritual because i know that uh, creative people uh, you know some days like i i don't i'm just curious to understand whether you're those creative people who sticks with the habit or who kind of goes with the flow i like to i like to stick with a habit i'm okay. i'm in that category okay. i like to have a routine i'm very uh, <laughs> this is a criticism of myself i'm very i'm a fixed person i don't okay. do well with change in my routine um, because i do think that for me it's important that i am there working at that time you know right. and inspirations come when i am working right sometimes they come when i'm walking down the street or going shopping doing something you know looking yeah. at the sky or the sunset and those are wonderful moments to cherish but my but those moments of revelation that come out of nowhere you know right the moments where you where you find yourself in the flow and then suddenly something happens and you think where did that come from how did that happen i didn't do that did i do that you know those moments are what i live for and they come when i am in the studio at that particular time i know i have to go there and i have to put in the work i have to focus on my craft because yeah. as an artist that's all you can do you can focus on the craft your technique and the leave the rest to the gods you know so to speak <laughs> what are you working on right now is my like painting and what you like in terms of dance what's going on well there's a lots there's lots going on all the time and uh, currently i'm working on a painting commission uh, right. uh this uh, individual you know in in his adult life realized that um growing up the way he was asked to be a man was was so limiting to him mm -hmm. and and it did not allow him to flourish as an individual it did not put him in touch with his own feminine side which in yeah. his estimation would have made him a more consummate person so he wanted me to work on a painting that would capture that kind of an and in a awakening let's just call it that so yeah. i am the kind of artist who likes to work in metaphors because i like poetry i like metaphors i stay away from literal interpretations so i delved into the greek mythology i delved into the greek story of the birth of uh, aphrodite through the union of hermes who is the messenger of the gods and aphrodite who is the goddess of love you know so the and and they give birth to this um being uh who then eventually has the characteristics of both a man and a woman at the same time and in other words it's a it's a complete being it's in a harmonious being where there's yeah. no conflict yeah right. and where there's no conflict there's harmony and where there's harmony there's beauty oh, yeah. so i wanted to capture that that um sensibility through this this myth this symbol actually so i'm right. i'm a great uh, I, i really love uh, metaphors and symbols because i think they can help us no i'm rabble some of the human mysteries that can be very baffling and 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 can throw us off uh, so this is the painting that i'm working on you know um and then dance wise i'm uh, for after a very long time uh, we are working on a group uh in a in a group with i'm working with two other dancers from new york and uh, my mentor maya kulkarni ji is um, choreographing it and we are going to premiere it in august before a live audience so i'm very excited about that lovely um uh, so that's why i want to ask you you know when you're painting you're sort of a solo artist and mostly like in dance as well you're, you're solo as well what is it like to sort of share space with other bodies like what when i'm sharing space with other bodies in dance 
well you have to be conscious you have to really i mean treat the stage as a canvas it's the same it's the same you know because you when you're learning how to paint when you're learning how to dance you are learning the 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 basics of balance of proportion of you know uh manas which is measurement in shilpa shastra and pramana which is uh, proportion and they are they are uh, they are the principles that apply both to the visual arts and the performing arts so when you are sharing the space with other dancers you have to be aware of their bodies what kind of energy they are creating and then you have to align yourself with that you know so you can't just be self indulgent and say oh i'm going to jump this high and i'm going to show off my ability to do yeah. this and that no you can't do that you have to you are a unit you are one unit there you are yeah. not an individual separate dancer you are a part of that that yeah. composition and that composition has to come alive so your focus is is different um but at the same time i i do think that each dancer in that group has a responsibility then to 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 have that to come at that same level of understanding and and to work towards that um final aesthetic experience the rasa that we want to create so that yeah. has to be the um the focal point in that uh, in the making of that dance so i find i find it very um invigorating challenging at the same time because i've been a soloist for so long yeah. that uh, this is this is an exciting new challenge yeah Uh, you you are both a painter and a dancer i was just thinking that uh, when you dance um are you sense painting when you paint do you feel like you're in a sense dancing i'm just curious how that works well i could talk about this all day you know but i know you don't have all night and all day uh it's very difficult akila for me to separate myself as a dancer and as a painter yeah you know and i'll tell you i'll give you a quick example okay yeah. i think it's it's easier for me to talk in terms of ideas than to say this is what i do or that is what i do uh you know if you look at our chitra sutra for example mm-hmm. uh, which is part of the vishnu dharmottara purana if you look at chitra sutra there is this section on kaksha vibhaga okay mm-hmm. so what what it says is that if you want to show a narrative hmm. you only have one plane yeah the plane hmm. of the canvas or the paper on which the artist is painting or drawing so let's just take for example the uh, the uh, uh uh miniature paintings of the geeta govindam yeah whether they are kangra miniatures or they are basoli paintings hmm. you have radha in hmm. one corner yeah you have her you show you show her in a house she's mm-hmm. sitting the fourth wall of the house is taken out yeah so you see inside the house okay. there she is the vasaka sajja she's getting ready blah 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 and then on in this corner you see the same radha coming out where she is the abhisarika so you have you know you have her you see the clouds and the and the the, the lightning and the, there's the snake and she's scared and all of you know all the lakshana are there so you know she's abhisarika there and over here in this corner you see the same radha looking at krishna where she finds him and he's in a you know under in a grove playing the flute or in a repose of some sort and then in this other corner you see them both together uh, uh, in the dark grove and there's swans and there you know uh, peacocks and this and we are all familiar with this yeah. yeah now look at how space and time have been dissected in this yeah, yeah. you have you have the entire drama unfolding on this plane now let me ask you isn't this exactly what we do on stage right absolutely when we are dancing we are dividing the stage in different zones yeah and each zone has its has its uh, lakshana we, yeah. we we create them we yeah. create this make believe world in yeah. that zone and then move to we move to another zone and there we create another make believe world and so yeah. and so forth so this is what 
Nati Shastra and Chitra Sutra both call the Kaksha Vibhaga, the division of space. So how do you, where do you, where does dance stop and where does painting begin? Yeah. You know? I don't know. I don't know how to distinguish between these two. And the same thing with sculpture and architecture also. You know, the Vastu Shastra says, talks about the concept of the Bija and the Bindu, um, the Garbha, the Garbha Griha, and yeah. the Purusha, the Vastu Purusha Mandala. Now, this is all designed on a grid, on yeah. a grid that, that honors the sacred geometry of this Bindu, the circle around it, and the square around it. And it is on this grid pattern that all buildings were built. That is the same grid that is honored by the Ardha Mandala in, the, in dance. So the Vastu Purusha Mandala and the Natya Mandala are the same. Yeah. So where do you distinguish between architectural principles and the principles that govern dance? So wow. you know, it's very difficult to say that this is architecture, this is painting, and this is sculpture, and this is dance. So in Chitra Sutra, like, they say that, you know, this is a dialectic, by the way. So this is a conversation, just more like, more, uh, very much like the Greeks did. So a dialectic where somebody asks a question, then the person in conversation asks another question to that. And then there's an answer to that. And then there's another question from that. So yeah. this conversation between Markandeya and King Vajra is what Chitra Sutra is. So where Markandeya says that, you know, Unless you know music, you can't dance. Unless you know dance, you can't paint. And unless you know painting, unless you know how to paint, you can't sculpt. And unless you know how to sculpt, you shouldn't be making, building buildings. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you see how everything is so intricately, interestingly linked. Um, and this is, this is not me saying it. This has been yeah. said already. So, right. so, you know, uh, so that's my long winded answer no, to your simple question. <laughs> connectedness of it all. In, uh, I don't know, some long, perhaps we've started boxing these things and, you know, um, but I'm also curious about the whole concept of, you know, um, uh, the stillness in movement and the movement in stillness. I'm also curious about that as much about that like uh, I also want to talk to you a little bit about the work you shared with a beautiful excerpt from Kilpanatya am I oh yes yes uh, love to speak about that as well sculptures and um, the sculptures really uh, you know come alive and there's movement so I just want you to talk a little bit about the concept of stillness in movement and movement in stillness wow Akhila you have wonderful questions uh, but they do, they do demand a very long discussion and they're such beautiful questions. I'm trying to think how I can give a concise answer, yeah? Um, you know, stillness and movement are not separate in my estimation, in my understanding. Growing up, I remember going, to, I grew up in Bhopal, okay? That's in Madhya Pradesh. Yeah. And... I remember go my earliest childhood memories are those of visiting the Sanchi Stupa, the Buddhist Stupa. You know, it's one of the oldest archaeological sites um, where there's supposedly there are Buddha's relics. And then there are these Toranas which were built. Well, the Stupa was built during the time of Ashoka and then Toranas were built later. Anyway, as a child, I was... I remember my earliest memories are, I was so young to even understand anything at all. But I was so fortunate to have gone there many times, not just once, but many times. And I remember standing there. Now imagine a six-year-old, five-year-old standing, standing there and being completely enthralled by these sandstone sculptures these freezes and freezes and freezes upon freezes of Jataka stories, you know, where there's no Buddha to be found, by the way. There are monkeys jumping and apsaras flying and kinneras twirling and there are processions and there are kings and queens and their retinue. And I remember 
specifically is this image of shala bhanjika you know the shala bhanjika where there's the woman uh, she's holding on to the branch of a mango tree and she is leaning on it and 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 she <laughs> and she breaks it she breaks the branch that's why she's the shala bhanjika oh and why does she break the branch is because she's so voluptuous that her voluptuousness outweighs oh. the 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 fruit laden mango tree you know okay. so imagine the artistic just think about the the fantastic imagination of these artists yeah but what was what struck me was this is stone it is stone transformed into this beautiful image where you stop seeing the stone yeah and all you see is the beauty of this image that's yeah. all come and the life that throbs inside they are alive i yeah so the stillness and the movement idea that you refer to akila to me is the idea of the 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 idea of the jada and the chetan yeah 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 so the so the what is jada here the stone can be can be thought of as the jada element the inert element yeah. but it is not a dead inertia it is a potent inertia yeah. it has the potency of coming alive and yeah. what makes it chetan what makes it come alive is the imagination and the skill of the artist yeah so the artist is the medium to bring this to fruition in other yeah. words it to fulfill maybe its its own destiny that that is latent inside it anyway mm-hmm. these might be lofty some some might people might think these are too hoity toity thoughts but this is how i think okay so to me it's for me that stayed in my conscious and subconscious mind all these years right so when i pick up a a a paint a tube of paint to work with it is technically speaking a scientist would say what is what is there in it is just linseed oil and some dead pigment correct yeah? and then when i put it as i'm smearing it on a canvas what is that that a scientist might say oh that is just you know pigment and oil on cloth you just spreading it around but why do i keep doing that day after day after day after day right because the fundamental question is why bother with it huh. right so to me this is the big question that artists face every single day it makes no logical sense to do it but is there is that all that there is to it that is the next question one i ought to ask is life all about meaning, making logical meaning out of it or is there something more to it and this quest is the creative pursuit ah uh. keeps you going yeah. this quest is a creative pursuit that keeps you going that yeah. makes you wake up in the morning and you yeah. suddenly realize there is a new chetan that i need to awaken yeah today that could awaken through me if yeah. i am diligent if i am disciplined if i am putting in the time and the hours if i have i have set myself and my interests aside and yeah. there is something greater than me then that can flow through me Yeah. so am i a, a worthy receptacle or not have i honed myself to be that right so this is the this is the challenge for right. an artist you know right. and this is what makes life worth it worth living and the all the all the pain that goes along with it all the sacrifices and the and the the, the psychological emotional uh i wouldn't call it trauma but you know there is yeah. a price to pay there is always a price to pay <laughs> so for that for that artist to bliss you feel every now and then there is a big price behind it so anyway another long winded answer to your simple question so, so that's the stillness and movement for me you know yeah. that's all i can say about the chetan and the jai i also thought of how the artist also is the medium and the message at the same time right because the artist has the sense of being the medium but also yeah. the artist is the message itself right i guess you could you could construe it that way 
uh, but for me as an artist i don't and i've never to taken the stance of being the message because okay. then you know then i'm calling attention to myself and saying look at me i have something important to say uh you know i might might not have something important to say but who cares you know who cares i'm dancing madly in my studio who cares if i'm painting canvases after canvases i do it because i'm called to do it because there's nothing else that i can imagine doing yeah yeah Absolutely. sometimes this much do you think that to be an artist you also have to think of that for just a mad quality to it yes. <laughs> <laughs> this is not for the sensible person <laughs> you have to be absolutely insane to take yeah. this up <laughs> but you know at the same time it would be even more insane not to do it if you're called called to do it yeah so you, you know there is and and to be to pay heed to that call is is as important as as doing it right uh, and uh, one could you know one could uh, and and this happens this happens because we are trapped in a world where we have to make a living we have to take care of people we have responsibilities we have other things you know some people have children they have to take care of elderly parents and all these are facts of life you can't run away from them but if we let all that be an excuse to not to not take up what we are called to take up then i think uh something very unique and worthwhile will be lost and i i i i do i do think that one ought to be careful uh to not get swayed by the the yeah. trappings of the mundane you know right uh ms pai want to ask you a little bit about you grew up in uh, in madhya pradesh yes. and then uh, studied uh, uh, geeta chandran in delhi and i want to ask you about your relationship with india now I mean you know your roots like relationship with your roots because recently you did a work um, on migrants right yes and so i want to ask a little bit about how do you stay in touch with um, with the you know the happenings in the soil that you sort of in, belong in so i want to ask you like and uh, inspire you to create work in a land really far away i mean how do you kind of uh, manage to get the pulse of what's going on here and be able to create it in a, in a in your studio which is far removed from from where we are that's a very good question you know i would say that today it's not it's not a challenge to be informed uh that is because true. information flows 24/7 in fact we have to turn it off there's so much information that if you want to maintain any sanity you've got to switch it off so i you know in in that way i i stay in touch with current events in india i i do know what's going on i don't have the arrogance to claim that i i understand everything i can't but as an artist i can respond mm to how i understand it Correct. and i can respond to what it does to me as a human on a human level mm-hmm. because whatever it is i connect with it on a very human level whether it is in india or some other part of the world human suffering is human suffering you know so when uh, when last year for example the american india foundation had asked me to uh, and some other artists to create uh, some they were having a fundraiser for the migrant immigrants uh and and the the plight of you know the the horrors of what they were going through when the pandemic hit and i was watching these images on you know they were everywhere and i remember looking at it and i'm i was wondering what can i do with this what does one do with it I mean am I that self absorbed that I will go and show it in dance of how a mother is cradling her dying child how I can't do that 
I, I just cannot do that. So, but I had to do something because I was, I was asked to do, do it, you know. So I was, um, I was so disturbed by it that I realized that we as dancers can sometimes get so self obsessed and self, you know, they, because that's, that's our art, that's our craft. It calls us to do that. We put ourselves out there and say, look at me, look at, yeah. look at what I can do. You know, this is my skill. Let me show it to you. Right. And that is a part of being a dancer. But I couldn't do that in this case. And I thought, how about if I just obliterate myself? What would happen if nobody saw Mesma at all? Oh, nice. So yes. that's why I, I created that dance with the mask where I, where I covered my face and I covered every part of my body with that sheet, white sheet. And the challenge for me then is, will my body speak through this? Will it be eloquent enough to communicate what I'm trying to say without being self-aggrandizing about it, you know, without being saying, here I am and look how, what I can do. I couldn't do that. I, mm. I just, I didn't have it in me. Uh, so whatever I did, I, I did it with great humility and an and awareness and an empathy for you towards human suffering. That's all I could do from here. And I think that one can do that no matter where one is in the world. And that is what makes us human is that we can see the other person as ourselves that there is no distinction between that person on the street and you. Uh, and art can sensitize you yeah. on that level. You know, that's why I feel grateful that I have this uh, artillery and ammunition to work with. And I'm yeah. grateful to my gurus who have taught me how to do it, you know, yeah. at the same time. Yeah. Uh, you used a beautiful word about respect, right? I want to just ask you that, especially in the context of the now, in a very sort of a, like a dynamic changing landscape with so many narratives and so many like, um, you, know, the, you know, struggles and challenges that we're going through. Why is it important for dancers to respond? Why is it important for them to, to use this word, beautiful word, artillery and ammunition, to use that to actually respond to the world around suffering, uh, to actually uh, respond to it with like using dance? Why why do you think more should do that? Well, I can't speak for everybody, you know, because everyone has their own, let's just call it, their, their own connection with their, with their medium. Correct. And what they are exposed to, how they think about the world and their place in it, it varies. Yeah. Uh, but I think if I can turn this question around, I would ask, what would happen if nobody did anything? What kind of a dystopian world will we create if we were all quiet and did not respond or did not reach out or did not make others aware who might not be aware of what's going on, you know? And I, I'm not saying that we must become didactic and we must become preachy and say, you know, I am right and you're wrong. And uh, that's not the way to go about it either. So I don't have all, all the answers. I, all I can say is that as an artist, you can sensitize, you are already sensitized to the yeah. world. You have to be, otherwise you can't create. Right. So if you can just bring that out and present it to offer it to the world, that that could be enough because you never know what light bulbs you are turning on in what part of the world because now you it's your oyster the world is your oyster there's no you you can't there's no limitations in that way you know yeah. of course not all of us have gadgets and not everybody has uh, the means to do that and i'm aware of that also but at the same time even before we had these gadgets, even before we had all these means, people were still reaching out to one another. You know, people were still empathizing on a human level. So I don't think that will ever go away. I think artists 
then can oh, sorry i i went away for did you did i did i lose you something happened yeah okay good um so i i sorry i lost track of my thought but i i do i don't think that this is again this is the solely the responsibility of an art of artists you know i think politicians have right. to be, take have to take responsibility i think social workers have to take responsibility policy makers have to make take responsibility uh economists have to take responsibility so this is not just on the artists and say okay you know what are you doing to make the world a better place no yes. this won't <laughs> we are we are a part of the greater whole yeah, absolutely absolutely uh, uh miss a little bit about your mentor maya kulkar mm -hmm. and uh, you, um just what is it like to i mean you know what is it like to have a mentor but like what what is it like to have a mentor like maya kulkar what do what uh, you know some of the um, you know key learnings that you've had by what you having a mentor like her well um i feel like i've been very fortunate i must say i've been very fortunate with the kind of gurus i have had you know before i came to mayadi i had um, shankar hombal sir lay the foundation of bharatanatyam for me yeah. then i had uh, geeta chandranakka build on that foundation and give me such a wealth of knowledge musicality intricacies of dance poetry i mean i could go on yeah uh and they all gave me so much love on top of that and the faith Trust that they had great they still have i think <laughs> I, i hope they still have great faith in me although shankar hombasar is no more but i still see him watching over me so and then when i came to maya de i was already in the united states for many years and feeling culturally displaced and agonized within and i i found myself um you know uh unable to really create my own voice uh and then my paintings also were agonized and there were decapitated bodies and disemboweled figures and it all showed it all showed so when i uh fall i i didn't know about michael kanji before um before i met before i met her uh i i heard her name and something about her name rang a bell i don't know what i thought this name says something to me speaks to me it speaks to me so i gave her a cold call she didn't know who i was and i said i want to meet you and she was very generous to call me over and she said yeah come home and uh, she made me dance for her and the rest is history this was about 10 years ago now and so we've been working together for 10 years and with mayadi you know she's like family to me um uh, we talk we go for long walks we uh we discuss well relationships life <laughs> everything uh and it was she in fact who encouraged me to uh start painting again because i was going through a very bad phase and i stopped uh i couldn't pick up the brush uh but she encouraged me she said don't give this up uh you must take it up again and then with dance you know a mentor is really like a gardener okay yeah. you know beautiful metaphor in, yeah in the garden if you have a bush growing or a tree growing sometimes the tree grows the bush grows in ways that it need not grow or it does not doesn't suit it you know it will it will uh, develop fronds and stems in all all over the place and what does a gardener do it it goes in the she, he or she goes in the garden and trim trims it prunes it shapes it gives it shape mm. in in for lack of better word tames it's it tames the the wildness that is right. within the, the <laughs> within that um, shrub you know? absolutely and and that act of somewhat taming it just to give it the right just to point it in the right direction if it's not facing the sun it will turn its head to the sun you know so that it can grow better right. so this is what mayadi has done for me 
Beautiful. That's all I can say. I mean, I can't, you know, I can't go into specifics of, I could, yeah, of course, I could say about Alavo and Abhinaya and that and that, but, you know, that's understood. I mean, she yes. has, she has changed the way I dance and she has also pushed me to go beyond the comfort level of being a Bharatanatyam dancer, because let's face it, there is great comfort and we all delight in mm -hmm. our Varnams and Padams. And I love it. I love doing the Margam. I love practicing it. It is, mm, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's our food. It's the grist of my mill, if you will. It inspires me. So I need to eat it. I need to eat that food. Yeah. Thank but you. then when I've eaten that food, then what? Thank That's you. where she pushed me. She said, no, you can do more than this. I Thank see you, you as a different dancer, you know, because she could see what I couldn't see. And then that's when we started working on the Shilpa Natana idea uh, and my background in visual arts and her imagination and her great capacity of creative thought. Um, we all, both of us came together and, and started to create. And that's how we have Shilpa Natana and we created Plato's Allegory of the Cave. And there's another dance on Medea. Uh, Greek, uh, the Greek um, sorceress. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, I could talk about that at other time. But yeah. I don't know if I'm doing full justice to her. Um, I'm, I'm sure I'm falling short. But uh, that's that's what I can think of right now. Yeah. I just want to say one thing. You used the metaphor of the gardener. You said for the last 10 years. I want to say she's almost like the constant gardener. <laughs> yes, she watches over me, and she 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 check she you know she said no no you you don't do less do less of that <laughs> do, do, and you do that thing and I don't know where it came from you know don't do that <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah Mesma, there's a question from uh, uh, Vijaya and she said who are the artists who inspire you oh gosh. There are many, Vijaya. There are so many artists, you know. I can't, I can't even begin to name them. I, well, let's just say, first of all, all the gurus who have, who have molded me are constant inspiration to me. Then uh, in, in, in dance, I, I would say, mm, oh, my goodness. I mean, I have to, I have to go back to the oft repeated ones, you know, Pala Saraswati, Yamini Krishnamurti, Malvika Sarukaiji. Uh, this is there's so many. I, I can't, uh, you know, um, uh, Vajanti Malaji, so many of them. And now I feel so odd even taking their names because they're, you know, great people. Um, and a painting. I'm, I was more, I'll tell you one thing. When I went to um, Delhi College of Art to study um, uh, applied arts, I really enjoyed my art history lessons. And uh, we had a fantastic professor by the name Seema Srivastava. And she introduced me and others to the world of European art, to which I had, I had not known much of for, a, for my whole childhood. And then... I came to know from prehistoric art, you know, to the modern and postmodern Western art. But what I connected most with, I'll tell you, is the pre-Renaissance, the Romanesque art, uh, the art of the, um, of, the, of the icons, the Christian icons. Because there is a similarity in the way that they treat space and time and form like like in Indian miniatures, there is a certain truth that they are after. And that is the truth of the third eye, you can call it that. It is, you know, the world not seen through the two eyes. Because I, as an artist, I'm always interested in what is it that my eyes don't see. You know, there is that whole world of art where it's called photorealistic art. For example, there are painters who can paint so beautifully that you can't tell the difference 
whether it's a photograph or a painting it is wrought so well you know but my imagination is sparked by the other kind of art where it doesn't look realistic at all but there is some other truth that is shining through it and that's what i, I i'm always drawn to is what is it that my eyes are not seeing and i i want to be the medium to bring that out and to display that so those were the artists who inspired me i mean in the modern times i would say um there are three artists i can name quickly um anjali lamenan manjit bawa and achutan ramachandran um anjali lamenan for of course her beautiful depictions inspired by the same source you know she also talks about this uh, of the romanesque and the russian icons um uh, manjit bawa i mean <laughs> what do i say about him again echoing the sensibility of the indian miniature paintings and achutan ramachandran composition color oh my goodness it is the you know echoing the murals of the uh, kerala temples it's just i mean i i feel so small even talking about these people but they have been constant inspiration to me uh thank you so much uh Uh, question before i let you go and hit the one hour uh, mark uh, your your dance is really about strength and grace power and poise and some of i've just like i may be wrong but just the coming together of the masculine and the feminine uh, i want to ask you like um, uh you know sort of one androgynous sort of quality of your dance like i don't know i i find you videos that i have watched I haven't watched you like age but like i feel that i'm just curious like how does that happen is that a conscious process or how do you like how do you bring that quality of strength that, or do we all have that with us because you earlier in the uh, interview you spoke about um, you know the work that your um, client is commission that you're working on about um, he has gotten to connect with the feminine side of his soul and how you're trying to like you know you talked about harmony that occurs with energies come together please talk a little bit about that sure um you know it's again it's not a conscious process killa because my work as a dancer is to work on my technique is to put in my hours and whatever comes out comes out i have no control i'm not consciously creating something that is that is you know trying to be this or trying to be that because then that would be that would become something different what i'm trying to do is to be the best dancer that i can be as i know most people are and the masculine and the feminine is within all of us right it's within all of us and to harmonize that like i said before yeah is will give birth to some semblance of beauty yeah of a resolution and a place where none of the concepts matter yeah those because, sort of because the idea is to create an aesthetic experience the idea is to create a rasa uh, yeah and how do you create it 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 is created when you are when you as an artist are um Uh, are aligning yourself with all that is the right thing to do in yeah. your craft yeah you are basically submitting right. to something that is greater than you you, right. you are following the rules you and then it is the individual that is set aside and then something else comes forth right right and it will save you <laughs> it will save you from staring into the horrors of the night as what nietzsche called you know the german philosopher nietzsche because he said that is the role of the art is to save the eye from staring into the horrors of the night huh. so is it the, is it whether it's masculine or feminine this is yin and yang this these are two aspects of the universe within which we live 
so if they come out in 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 that in that, in that creative expression then i i say then great then i must be doing something right you know yeah. <laughs> yeah. absolutely um Miss, but there's one question from Soham, and he said, "Do you have any advice for someone who wants to have a career by selling art?" Oh, um, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid, and don't let self-doubt come in the way. We all have that. Put yourself out there, uh, but not in a you know look at me way. Uh, genuinely, put in the hours. Uh, put be hone your skills, hone your craft. Uh, hone your imagination. Read about other people. You know, read philosophy, read poetry, read the power of metaphor, read human history, what civilizations have created. Because we are standing on their shoulders. We are a repository of memory of great civilizations. We are not. We just didn't come out of nowhere. You know, we we are we are a, a, a consequence of of zillions and zillions of. people's contribution on this planet so be humble and and recognize that be grateful and then allow yourself to go let go of yourself in that process and that's a beautiful thing and once you do that that something original will come because the quest for originality is very is key you know yeah. uh you can one can be inspired by other people but if you copy them then your original your what you can bring is unique to you so that will be lost so that's important that you are you are aware of that you you have the commitment and the conviction and i won't say confidence i don't think confidence is a good idea unless you have clarity you need to have clarity of vision and then you apply yourself to it you apply yourself day in and day out and day in and day out and then one day something might happen and even if it doesn't happen you will have lived a fulfilled life and i think that's worth a whole lot more than any so called success or so called money and this and that accolade um those are just you know their consequences of of hard work over a long period of time Absolutely. Oh, selling artwork! Oh gosh, I, I'm so bad at selling artwork. I, 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 I shouldn't be the one giving advice on how to sell artwork. Really, <laughs> I, I, I will not say anything about that. I don't know what to say. <laughs> <laughs> I, I truly must say that I have so many fantastic things from this conversation. I'm no dancer, but this just has everything that you said. I think is also like a uh, beautiful. Said that you know, so many principles that you talked about are applicable. Need to live our lives. I mean, so many things, especially the when you started off, you talked about how you wake up and you think about, am I better than I was? Did I do something better yesterday? And I think that that's a great, great wake up. And I'm going to try my best tomorrow. Don't I... beat yourself up, though. <laughs> Don't be like me. <laughs> it's a very hard way to live. <laughs> and i also felt the whole of that little bit of sanity to kind of uh, you know sort of pursue the path i also like the beautiful uh, thought that you shared about self self absorption and sometimes how you really need to shed that self absorption mask and to really respond with empathy and sensitivity uh, i mean the importance of metaphors the importance of reality the beautiful fluidity that happens in you know in painting and dance and sculpture and architecture I mean, so many fantastic takeaways from this conversation. I hope people will listen to it later on IGTV, saved on our page. Thank you, Ms. Ma. Truly, my great day. And I'm going to definitely like feel like this was a better, going to be a better week than it was. So, thank you for inspiring and for sharing all the many inspirations that keep you going. Thank you, Akila. I'm so grateful that you do invited me on this. I've been following your. i mean exhaustive commendable work for a long time now i don't know how you do it all but we all artists are so grateful to your commitment and and the energy that you bring to it it's it's really uh, uh, awe inspiring so thank you so much and i want to thank all these people who are here 
and they are asking yeah. wonderful questions but i am afraid we don't have um time yeah. to to address them but you know you can always reach out to us i'll be happy to answer yeah. any questions uh, that Ms. i can get to avitri jagannath rao uh, amba he mentioned uh, shankar kalana from uh, kala kalakshetra yes yeah. yes from the kalapadma academy in pop oh, thank you thank you so much um, okay lovely to know that yes okay. bye 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 everyone thank you thank you everybody bye